So, um, also, something that you really need to understand is that if conflict arises with somebody, you need to be in deep prayer about it. Oh, good. Ah, uh, it hurts. My Um, this is from memory. Now. If there is a team member that is causing a problem, um, be in deep prayer about what's happening and then speak with them quickly. And um, just speak a word of correction and love to them. And if they still are not in alignment with um, what the team needs to be doing, what the missionary is asking you to be doing, point to verses in the Bible and be like, you need to um, you need to be a servant rather than an obnoxious pig. So make sure you can have that conversation with them. We'll deal with that more in training later. So leadership suggestions: delegate to as many leader members, team leader, team members as possible on the trip, so everyone takes ownership of the mission and feels involved. Don't be afraid to speak a word of connection when necessary. Pray first for God's heart on the matter, then speak clearly and frankly. A word of connection? <laughs> I mean, who wrote this? <laughs> Alex swore that he didn't write this. Pray first for God's heart on the matter, then speak clearly and frankly. That's fair. Get their side of the story and listen openly. If you still feel like their direction isn't aligned with the Lord's, give the biblically based advice based and motivated by a desire for complete restoration. If you are a fearless team leader over in the third world, we're going to need you to do a couple of things. We're going to need you to delegate a bunch of responsibilities uh, to um, all of your team members. So whether you have someone who's in charge of the food or the water or keeping a second copy of all the um, emergency evacuation numbers or the medical insurance cards or you have someone who's with communication with the transportation services or the interpreters and translators and church members and missionary just give something to each person on the trip so they feel involved and that they are invested that they own part of the trip and if they let that down um, they've let the team down they will be very much more um, connected and consider you guys a family working close together if the success of the mission is tied to how much they put into it. And the team um, can either succeed or fail if they don't buy into that. So um, work on that cohesion during team training a lot over the next several months while you're still in the country. Cut. Print. Post. Render. Hi, uh, my name is Jerry Moore. Given name is Ivor Gerald Moore, but uh, everybody knows me as Jerry. Uh, I've spent uh, approximately 20 some years doing outreach, you know, to the homeless. Uh, for instance, the South Central, not just to the homeless, but older people, people in need, people having different needs, been involved a little bit with uh, prison outreach and prison ministry also. I think uh, the thing that makes a great leader, a good leader in ministry, has to do with uh, sensitivity. Uh, one has to really be aware of uh, not only the situations you're in, uh, because you're you're going to be in between the people and the mission and the people that people are going to work for and to help. So there has to be a sensitivity there because you have all kind of uh, agendas, all kind of uh, people have their personal uh, views of what they think things are going to be. So you just have to be aware. I mean, you have to be aware of the culture you're dealing with, the, the people you're dealing with, uh, and how to communicate to people lovingly, compassionately, you know, empathetically. You know, those are uh, points, qualities you have to have. And you have to keep, remember, agenda is very important. One of my favorite scriptures is when the Lord told Moses uh, to tell the people, go up and take the land. And, uh, of course, when it came time to go, people uh, in the ministry or in the tribes, uh, they were coming up with different things to do that sounded good, sounded wise, uh, you know, about check out the land first. But you have to be aware also uh, that when people start coming up with different things, it may sound good, but maybe they're not in, they're not in step with the program. They're not in agreement with the program. There might be ways that you're trying to cop out or... Uh, 
So, and you have to be obedient to the vision that God has given you, you know, to your skills and abilities. And also you have to be able to recognize, uh, <clears throat> and by being led by the Holy Spirit, what different people's gifts are. And that it's a two-way street, you know, people coming to help are getting helped, you know. It's uh, and people that are, uh, I would, my saying, favorite saying was that every time I went to thinking I was going to bless, I got blessed. Uh, flexibility, uh, well you have to be flexible because you're going to have to bend. Uh, I mean, you got to be flexible, God's going to make you bend because <laughs> you're going to have directions, you're going to have things that you've been uh, praying about, things that you've been uh, figuring was going to be the best thing, but then you're going to find yourselves on the stormy water, you know, I mean, the, and you're going to have to make some new decisions, you know. God's going to lead you, and you have to be open to going the way God leads you, you know. Um, let me share a story. I don't know if this covers really flexibility, but my brother was in India. He was teaching, and he said that um, I found myself praying for him, uh, for his safety a lot. So I came to find out later that what was happening, the police had come to him and the people uh, that, that the ministry he was working with, uh, doing the outreach for, and said that uh, some people had gotten together and they decided that they had to take care of this foreign pastor. And uh, Donald said people were coming, getting saved, and uh, they had long, these long prayer lines, and they were praying for people, and people were getting delivered and healed. He said, but he noticed after a few days that the uh, problems, uh, a lot of the prayers were for people uh, seem to have back trouble and uh, a lot of stuff that were kind of bronchial problems and stuff. So he said he started watching and during the daytime and he noticed that people were using these small brooms and they were hunched over sweeping and dust coming up. So he, being brilliant, he went and uh, got this long stick and he added it to the... Uh, <clears throat> to the brooms, and they, but he, what he did was he didn't uh, present it to the people. First he went to the pastor from the ministry that he was there on behalf of, that he was working with, and he said, the pastor told him, said, well, yeah, the Christian women would probably use the brooms, but the other people wouldn't, and that would be because of tradition. Uh, and the tradition there, he said that the, the motion that would have to be used to sweep with uh, was a motion that they, the cast the, the cast of grave diggers did, so most people wouldn't do that. So even though it seemed like a very simple solution, you know, uh, number one, what he did in terms of leadership, he honored the leadership that was there. Number two, they were familiar with the people, with the culture. Uh, and number three, uh, he knew that he had to go along with the program there, what was going to be best for the people. and. Uh, if we stay open to uh, the situation that God has us in. God's teaching both sides. You know, we're learning on both sides. People are getting delivered. We're getting to be a part of God's uh, blessing for people, but we're being blessed at the same time as He's growing us and giving us the opportunity to reach out. So flexibility, yeah, that means we have to be open to God and open to the Holy Spirit and the direction of the Lord in the situation. What was the conclusion to that? Did He... So they weren't able to implement, or did he find a way around the caste system thing? No, no, he he left it up to the the pastors there, the pastors who were going to churches there that God had them doing there. So he left it with them, and they went on and just continued to minister the way they were ministering, and uh, he returned home safely. <laughs> because uh, they did get the favor of, of the police, and he said there was a point where they actually had to. Uh, you know, increased security for them, you know. So. Who, what, who were they in danger of? The people or the police were protecting them or who were they in danger of? Oh, oh no, they were in danger. Uh, you had, well, you know, you had this whole thing, the suppression of Christians. Uh, the pastor there, Pastor Abraham, they're in northern India, where they've had their, the churches burnt, uh, homes burnt, uh, people have been attacked, you know. But uh, so, and it, it's been a combination, sometimes from Muslims, sometimes from the Hindus. And how long ago was that? Oh, it's still going on. You know, it's still going on. We have teams on. going to India. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> ah, I don't want to discourage anybody or frighten anybody. But uh, you just have your friends stay aware to pray, keep yourself prayed up. And uh, 
Uh, when you go into situations like that, I've been in situations where people say, no, no, don't go. But uh, I remember one time we were, uh, I told somebody, well, we're going to South Central and saying, oh, no, not that particular neighborhood is the worst. And the people that were working there said, no, it's the safest place in the world on Sunday. This is the safest place to be, you know. You know, you hear gunshots and everything, but it never came near us. And actually, the uh, gangs were, uh, gave us favor also. That's because they knew you were Christians? Yeah, and they knew why we were there. You know. Why were you there? We were doing God's work. We were there to reach out to them, to their younger brothers, their younger sisters, to uh, help in their family, with their families. Um, at the time, we were also doing things to try to help them with their education, you know, and fellowship. So there was an appreciation for that. Uh, there was this one Sunday since we're at it now, uh, Elsa and I ended up, my wife and Elsa, uh, ended up going, everybody was out of town from the ministry, so we went to uh, minister alone. And it was this motel, it had a reputation of being uh, the worst spot in, in the worst community in L.A. County. Uh, LAPD had said that. So we pull up this one Sunday. And uh, we had our hot dogs and stuff that we were going to feed people. And I had this little keyboard. And uh, we set up our PA system and we're getting ready to go. But what happened when we got there, the gang, this new gang had taken over the motel. And they had sentries at the doors. And uh, it was funny because you could see the post. They had two rooms and they had sentries outside of one. But another one seemed to be where they were, uh, may have been keeping the dope and stuff. <clears throat> And music was blasting. Well, they had the music blasting. So we're setting up, and uh, the devil starts talking to me about, oh, man, you know, you don't know these guys. You know what could happen. They could off you and take Elsa and turn her out and put her on the streets. You know, uh, anything could happen. And most of, So we were there. But anyways, it kept going. We set up. And uh, what was really cool was once I said, we had the mic set, and I said, check, one, two. Saw two of the guys get up and walk over into this other room, they came out, they turned off the music, uh, they stopped their activity, we had set up some chairs, and uh, some of them came and sat, you know, and so we, you know, shared scripture, and you know, and uh, shared a word with them, and offered people to come up for prayer. And then afterwards, I was really stoked because they had actually, you know, stopped the, any dealing. You're going to have to stop doing that. <laughs> they stopped any dealing while we were ministering. And uh, what happened was uh, I got really excited then. I said, okay, because this is what we really have been here for, you know, and I knew the guys would be back the next week. Uh, and... Uh, so uh, during the week, I was all excited and thinking about getting ready because uh, here were some guys we'd be able to help, maybe even get some people directed toward jobs and different uh, possibilities. And uh, so the next week, uh, Virgil was back, and Virgil was sharing with these guys how he talked about his rap sheet, you know, and uh, said his rap sheet would reach from there to the street corner. And, uh, he shared his witness and they identified. But this time we had even more, because more people, I guess, from the gang, they had come. And, uh, oh, and the dealers that were in that motel, before these guys, it was funny, because they came up to me at one point and they said, uh, hey man, can you guys pray them out of here? Can you pray them out of here, man? Because <laughs> they were, this other crew was a bigger crew, more organized, and uh, so these little, uh, local dealers <laughs> were asking if we would pray them out. But it got to the point when uh, we were ministering, they would stop dealing. And sometimes we'd minister so long that people that came in to get their drugs would get straight. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sometimes the people would come, they're sitting, they're trying to wait for us to finish because they wanted to cop the drugs. And, uh, yeah, someone would get straight, get sober while they're waiting. Uh, but what happened was, uh, you don't always know what 
exactly God's plan was. I began to think about all these, the potential of the things we could do. Uh, and a lot of that was ego-centered, you know, because like, wow, look, we it reached these people and all this stuff. But uh, we came the next week, they were gone. Totally gone. And I felt like, oh, I guess I should have been more active and been there during the week. And uh, I remember Virgil was saying, well, we planted the seed. God gave us a situation, an opportunity, you know, and we have to be faithful then. Uh, can't always wait. And that, you know, that can be a problem. I hate when I, I, I go away from a situation and then I'm thinking to myself, why did I say that? And that was the stupidest thing that could possibly be said. You know, and, uh, you know, and then, but, you know, I, I, I'm rescued by that, uh, that old saying uh, that says some plant, you know, some water. You know, that's, that's rescued me many a time because, uh, you know, I just, I, I hate, but it's better to say something than nothing. Uh, I think one thing you have to remember and maybe even encourage people with is the fact that we are servants. You know, and we're there, we're, we're there to be in service. Uh, even in terms of leadership, don't think in terms of leadership. Think in terms of being of service. Jesus Christ was a servant. You know, we're, we are the foot washers, you know. And uh, we're there to do service. Uh, we have to be sensitive to uh, how we can best serve. Uh, so, yeah, it's not always going to be exactly the way we wanted it, but we have to realize we're taking God's compassion, God's love, God's caring, and we're sharing that. Um, we're encouraged. What I love about uh, the story of Job uh, God calls Job. He said, my servant. Have you considered my servant Job? And one thing it says in that scripture, and when you read about Job, is that it says Job looked for those that he could help. He went out in search of those that he could be of service to, that he could help. He didn't just take his gifts and his blessings, and if people came by or if he happened to bump into them, but he went out. And when you're going out doing mission, that's what you're doing, you know. You're going out, you're fulfilling God's purpose, you know. And if the team remembers that they're in service, you know, that we yield our egos, you know, it's God's thing. You know, we got to set our egos aside, you know, and go for the overall thing because we can't actually see the end of the thing right when we're right in the middle of it, you know. Okay. So, biblical basis for mission, I mean, it's, it's, it's all throughout Scripture. You know, it's God's call to us, whether it's from Isaiah saying, uh, the Lord has anointed me to take care of the poor, to go into the prisons. Uh, Jesus telling his disciples that finally, uh, you know, all power in heaven and earth are, are, are mine. And then he gives it to them and he tells them, go into the whole world. You know, uh, whether it's the Beatitudes and Matthew, you know, to care for the needy and the poor. Uh, even when the, uh, uh, Peter, that's a great, I love Peter. Uh, the whole thing, the first time Jesus says to him, you love me, he says, tend my lamb. The second time, you love me, uh, tend my sheep, uh, to feed my sheep. Then uh, the other time he tells him, uh, well, if you love me, you know, you feed my sheep. And he's saying that to all of us, you know, I mean, that's what we're supposed to do, you know, with whatever abilities we have. I think what's real interesting was uh, Peter... Uh, at the point he's he says to Jesus, once they discover that it's Jesus walking on the waters during that storm, Peter says, Lord, if that's you, bid me come to you. And uh, I think sometimes for people, we look at ministries, we look at missions, and they look attractive to us, and uh, we kind of want to try them out. So Jesus doesn't say to him, uh, no, you, you don't have this ability, uh, you don't have this gift. So Peter wants to, and Jesus says, come on. You know, so Peter gets out the boat, and you can't be involved in missions and ministry if you're able to get out the boat. So he gets out the boat, and uh, he starts walking, and I think sometimes, what was it a little, was he, you know, what was he, I mean, it's not like he got out the boat and said, whoa, dudes, check me out, I'm water walking, you know. Uh, but there's that little flash of lightning or something that makes him think, maybe says to him, uh, 
you know, in the middle of his thinking, I'm doing, it's happening, it's really happening, I'm really doing this, I'm really walking on the water, and this little flash of thought comes to him and says, uh, you can't do this, man, you know, human being. Well, we've all been taught that he took his eye, he got his eye off the Lord, you know, and he began to sink. But here's the point, uh, two things, he wanted to try it, he wanted to follow and do what Jesus was doing, you know, so he got out the boat and made an attempt. And the other thing was when he was overwhelmed and people always in ministries are telling you how the things were beyond their ability to do and accomplish things and God always was there. Well, the point is this. Am I talking too fast? I don't know, maybe. But here's the point. Uh, when he found himself in a situation that he couldn't handle where he was about to be overwhelmed by his circumstances, uh, Jesus did not give him up to his circumstances. What I mean by that, God won't let you sink, he won't let you drown. Yeah. You sent them to me? Yeah. What do you do when you stumble upon a witch doctor? What do you do when you stumble upon a witch doctor? <laughs> what do you do when you come across a lone orphan? A lone orphan. Okay, you, I, you have to hug them up, you have to love them up, and you have to get them, uh, to the people that you're involved with, you know, point them to God, you know. You're, you're sharing the compassion, you know, you're encouraging them through, through just even your presence, you know. What do you do when team members fight? Pour cold water on them. What do you do when someone is attacked on your team? You're talking about physically attacked. When someone is physically attacked, uh, try to cover them. And I get that from the old uh, civil rights thing, freedom, you know, put yourself in harm's way if you're going to help protect them. What do you do when someone on your team is experiencing culture shock? <laughs> tickle them. <laughs> I hope they're ticklish. But no, uh, and then with, with all of these, you, you need compassion. With all of these, you need to try and get people to sit down for a minute, to reevaluate the situation, you know. To, to, uh, and the thing that you do, you should have done, and that would have been, you should have been prayed up, that's number one. And always, always carrying yourself in a state of prayer. You're, you're in a state of prayer. I mean, you're physically doing other things, but, you know, you're in a state of prayer. I mean. How do you present the gospel to a mime? <laughs> How do you present the gospel to a mime? I don't know, roll on the floor or something. I, I, when I saw that one, I said, that's pretty good. You know? What do you do when your whole team experiences traveler's diarrhea or Montezuma's revenge? You know, I've heard about those. And uh, I used to think when I was really overweight, not, you know, not quite like this, I used to think maybe I should go on a mission because <laughs> people lose weight. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you do if you've been poisoned? If you've been poisoned, okay, you cling to that scripture and, uh, uh, you know, get to the medical people that you have that are aware that maybe can deal with the type, depending on the type of poisoning that you have. Uh, and if you've been poisoned to the point that you know you're poisoned, then you, I would think that you're pretty, you might be in pretty good shape that the poison's not going to take you out. Uh, but you just need to recover, rest, pray, recover. What do you do if you've insulted the chief's daughter? <laughs> There's nothing you can do, it's too late. <laughs> What do you do if two missionary volunteers fall in love on the trip? Cold water. <laughs> you know, I thought that was very interesting because it's a great place to fall in love. You know, it's a wonderful place to fall in love. As long as they stay focused and, uh, you know, love each other from, admire each other's commitment to, to the trip and to the people. And, uh, what do you do if you accidentally start a war or incite a natural cultural conflict? If you actually start a conflict? Well, see, that's the result, you know. You ask forgiveness, you gotta go straight to the Lord, and you weren't paying attention to number one, follow your leadership, and that you're there as a servant, you know.